we're interested in making robots so small that you'd need a microscope to see them. To make these robots, you have to completely reimagine and redesign the process of fabricating these machines. So what's involved? Well, essentially a robot is composed of two parts, a brain and the actuating limbs. Now the brain, believe it or not, is actually simple because 50 years of Moore's law has solved that problem. We can now make microcircuits that are so small that they could fit really easily on the kinds of footprints that we're talking about. The legs, on the other hand, are a major challenge. So a group of us had this idea that maybe we could steal the fabrication tools that are used by the semiconductor industry to build the chips and then build the robot around the chip and then fold that robot into the three-dimensional shape that we want to make. Now, if you're going to start doing origami at the micro scale, you're only as good as the paper that you can manufacture. And one of the things that we had to learn was how to take advantage of the unique tools at the Cornell Nanofabrication Facility to create the world's thinnest paper, including a single sheet of graphene that we could cut up into a kirigami device, or these nanometer thin sheets that you're seeing on the right and the bottom. If you're going to be making origami at the micro scale, there's really two strategies. One is to shrink the origami artist, and that we still don't know how to do. The second is that you could have the paper fold itself. Here it is. This is a sheet of paper that's only 10 nanometers thin folding itself. How does it work? We start with a 7 nanometer thin platinum layer. We coat one side of the platinum with an inert material like titanium dioxide. We then fabricate the device that we want, and when we put it in solution and put a voltage on the platinum, we can get ions that are dissociated in the solvent to adsorb onto the platinum surface. When that happens, you create a stress that bends the device. If you now apply the reverse voltage, you can drive those ions away and the device returns to itself. If you put stiff elements, you can restrict the bending to occur where you want, and now you have an origami fold. We can now make devices that are only about a footprint of a hair diameter and can still fold and unfold, like this duck that you're seeing on the very right. This particular design graced the cover of Science Robotics this past March. As amazing as it is, there's still a little defect, which is that stupid wire that's hanging out from the bird on the left side. And one of the things that you can do in order to avoid those wires is put the power source on the device itself. So this is how we do it. You essentially create a photovoltaic or a solar panel and connect that up to the actuator so that when you shine light on the solar panel, it moves the limb. Now, uh, this was our first ever Hello World. This is uh, where we start getting really creative, putting photovoltaics for the front legs, photovoltaics for the back legs. We make bajillions of these devices and then put the pads on to restrict the bending so that we get exactly the folds that we want to actuate. And with that, you can create what we lovingly call Brobot. Brobot is here flexing his muscles. He has chest hair and belongs on a beach somewhere. But you can get the basic idea of what we're talking about here. You shine light on the front photovoltaics that actuates the limbs. Now, as amazing as Brobot is, he also has some defects. That, that chest hair, the technical term for that is schmutz. Uh, clearly, we ripped off its back legs. But if you work hard to solve these problems, you can create what is now the world's smallest walking robot, a 40 micron by 70 micron by 2 micron thick robot that folds itself up and walks off the page. The way this robot works is that we shine a laser on the front photovoltaic to activate the front legs and the back photovoltaic to activate the back legs. And in that sense, this robot, as amazing as it is, is still just a marionette being controlled by strings, in our case, laser pulses, that are moving each limb. How do we go beyond that? We are working now with a commercial foundry, XFAB, to create microchips that would go on these robots. In this particular case, I'm showing you a, micro a microchip that acts like a clock circuit. 
On the second image, you're seeing a wafer full of these microcircuits. We tested that it works right, and now we can use it to drive the robots without shining lasers at specific photovoltaics. This thing has a brain that coordinates the limb movements and gets the robot to move on its own. This is the moment where we cut the strings to the marionette and Pinocchio comes to life. And here you go. This is Antbot. It uses a hexapod gate, so a tripod on one side and a tripod on the other, to move itself forward. And all we have to do is put this robot in sunlight, and the brain does the rest of the coordination. What could we do with these kinds of robots? Well, basically anything you can imagine doing at the macro scale. Clean surfaces of bacteria, or use them to build different components, transport cargo from one location to another, maybe conduct microsurgeries or explore new worlds that are inaccessible when you look top-down using microscopic techniques. Projects like these can only happen when you get a whole crew of students, postdocs, working in various labs in a coordinated fashion. And that's exactly what works really well here at Cornell.